Good afternoon. For those of you who have been here all day, thanks for st staying with us. Uh, we are Sonic Diagnostics. Our project is um, an early Alzheimer's detection device um, in the form of a nanoscale biosensor. This is uh, James and Sibri, who are more of the business and safety team. Zach and myself were more of the technical design team, and our industry mentor was Mark Corrigan. He sadly could not make it today. So what you're going to hear from us is a brief introduction on our quote-unquote company. You're going to hear a background on Alzheimer's disease, um, a landscape of why it's such an issue. You'll see our technical sensor design, which we completely came up with on our own. You'll see our business plan as to how we would commercialize it. You'll see the safety concerns, which are very important, given that we're making an implantable biosensor. And um, we'll talk about some conclusions and some future ideas. So, Sonic Diagnostics is a startup spun out of Northeastern University's chemical engineering department. As I said, we're aiming to develop a sensor for early detection of Alzheimer's disease in order to help bring better treatment to individuals suffering from the disease. And we're in the process of trying to secure IP on the sensor that we'll be talking about. Just a very brief background on everyone. James has experience in the biotech industry and um, in business development ideas. Sibri also has biotech industry experience as well as quality assurance experience. I um, have a lot of experience working with nanomaterials and with micro and nanofabrication type of projects. And Zach has circuits and electronic experience as well as nanomaterials work. And so we were fortunate to have a group where everyone's backgrounds complemented each other and uh, really gave us a nice, really well-rounded profile. And so now I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of dementia, which is a loss of cognitive ability. You can't reason, you can't remember, and uh, you can't really function as you normally would. There's this metric from the World Health Organization called Disability Adjusted Life Years. And um, back in 2015, it was projected, or it was estimated, that there were 13 million of these life years lost to Alzheimer's. So it's kind of like saying 13 and a half million people have it and cannot live a normal life. And um, coinciding with that, the global cost of the disease is approaching a trillion dollars. And so it's a really big opportunity, both economically and from a healthcare point of view. Here we can see a um, number of people with dementia and it's rising from just under 50 million to um, well, well over 100 million moving forward. It's a country that, or it's a problem that affects individuals in higher income countries and lower income countries. And so, you know, really it's not unique to any one group or any one place. And then the last um, real issue with Alzheimer's disease is that compared to every other disease, um, it's the only one we're seeing that the medical community is getting worse at treating. So this graph is over a 10-year span. You can see every other major disease, the number of deaths is falling. Alzheimer's, it's almost doubled. And so, of course, it makes it imperative to come up with better solutions than what we currently have. Now we're going to talk about the pathology of the disease. This is a pretty intricate diagram because there are three competing theories. It's not even exactly well known um, what is happening. On the left hand side in the red is what's called the amyloid cascade hypothesis. And this theory is that there's this protein in your brain and if it decomposes at too high of a rate, it becomes this harmful plaque that gets deposited over neurons and causes cell death. A second theory is called the metal ion hypothesis, which states that an imbalance in metal ions in your brain serves as an accumulation site, again, for this plaque, and then again leads to cell death. And the last one is called the oxidative stress hypothesis, and um, that one is even less defined, but the theory there is that as you age, your cells naturally lose some of their ability to oxidize free radicals and other harmful compounds. And then as a result of that, you know, once again, 
to get the accumulation of this plaque. And so the common theme across all of these theories is an excess of what's called this alpha-beta amyloid plaque. And one of the biggest problems is that this plaque is only definitively able to be detected in tissue from a dead brain. Can't really do it in a living patient. And um, our theory then is not to detect directly for the plaque, but to detect for the protein that decomposes into the plaque. And so down here you can see an older schematic uh, from a reference of what this protein looks like. It's called amyloid precursor protein. On the bottom, there's these three sections, HBD, CUBD, ZNBD. Those are different binding domains of the protein. And so we're going to exploit the copper binding domain. Here we have a newer version of the same type of schematic. Again, you can see metal binding region. That's where we're targeting. And um, it shows that this part of the protein is outside of the cell. And then there's also an interior part of the protein that's inside the cell membrane. So it'll be really important for us when you see our sensor design that we have a really close relationship to the cells themselves so that we're able to reach this transmembrane protein. So currently Alzheimer's is diagnosed through a comprehensive series of medical tests, which include both physical, mental status, and neurological tests. Um, brain imaging is used to help uh, rule out any other possible causes of dementia-like symptoms, and it doesn't actually really help prove that the cause is Alzheimer's. Uh, and this results in a high prevalence of misdiagnosis. Um, and even the most skilled physicians we found are only able to uh, report an accurate diagnosis of up to 90% of the time. Uh, right now, there are two popular treatments, medical or medication treatments for the effects of Alzheimer's disease, one of which is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which help prevent the big breakdown of acetylcholine in the brain. And this in turn helps increase the strength and duration of uh, signals between neurons. Another one that is used frequently by patients is memantine. And this helps control the concentrations of the neurotransmitter glutamate within the brain. And that results in less destimulation or overstimulation of nerve cells, which cause cell death. Uh, however, these medications only really delay the worsening of the symptoms, and they don't actually cure the disease. Uh, and we, research has shown that the positive effects of these drugs only typically last up to a few years after medication is started. And this, the drugs themselves accrue costs of billions of dollars per year for patients. So now I'll be getting into what our sensor will look like. Just right before, I want to touch on those past two slides, is that we think our value is one, giving this diagnostic tool that's not really there, and then two, using it to help enable the development of treatments that actually target the problem and not just try to mitigate the problem of Alzheimer's. And so anyway, the first step in our fabrication is to order a uh, customized silicon platform from a foundry. Uh, Zach will talk about a lot of the embedded electronics that will come with this wafer, and um, that's all a pretty well established process in industry through the cell phone industry. <clears throat> we'll then pattern photoresist over the active sensing region. It'll look something like that. We will deposit our series of gold electrodes in order to serve as the sensing, the first step of the sensing platform. Then we will um, pattern electron beam resist, which gives you a smaller feature resolution. And um, so then it'll look like that. We will deposit gold again in the form of gold nanopillars. And then we will do what's called a copper ion implantation in order to functionalize the tops of the nanopillars. We will then strip off that last layer of resist and we will flip it over and do some backside thinning with deep reactive ion etching 
in order to make the whole system more flexible and biocompatible. And the one step I want to elaborate on is the ion implantation. That's uh, the most unique um, part of the process. Here you can see how ion implantation works. They actually shoot a beam of ions into a magnetic field. The magnetic field curves the ions into your substrate and then you're you know, literally bombarding it with these ions. And this is used in the semiconductor industry already, but the materials that are being implanted are typically boron or phosphorus. And um, it's only now emerging that there could be other applications if you're able to use a different material in the ion implantation. These two graphs um, are also important to the process, or these figures on the top. You can see how if you have some sort of mask, which we'll have in the form of the resist, you um, can selectively only implant ions in the spots that you want. And then you will also, based on your conditions, have some curve of ion concentration as a function of depth. And uh, our goal is to try to, as much as possible, concentrate those ions at the very top of the nano pillar. And um, so, like I said, we want a shallow implantation depth. And also, we're going to need a low dose. Otherwise, we run the risk of destroying those uh, nano pillars. And so, we'll be using these platforms for electrochemical sensing. We've um, identified nanopillars as a good option for us because we've seen in literature that neuron cells will actually kind of grab on to these nanopillars and form a really tight seal. And so that'll allow our platform to have direct contact with the transmembrane proteins. We um, modeled the reaction at the interface as an electrochemical cell where the cathode is the reduction of copper and um, that has a well-known potential. The problem is that the oxidation at the anode is not really well-known because it forms this complex conjugated compound. And um, one of the first experimental things we would have to do is try to identify a um, oxidation potential there so that we could better predict um, what types of signals we'd be receiving. But if I just use standard um, relationships between current, voltage, resistance. If we um, imagine that the nanopillar is a thin wire and we just, um, for simplicity, call that question mark 0 0.04 volts, then um, we can do some very simple math shown there and uh, we get a current that right now we're guessing might be around 78 milliamps coming through the nanopillar into the larger electrode. And then one more thing I wanted to touch upon was uh, doing a mass balance on the copper that we're implanting. We were able to guess about the longevity of the sensor. Um, we're thinking that it will be limited by the space of the neural interactions rather than the uh, chemicals in the nanopillar. Based on references we've seen for copper ion implantation, we think we'll have on the order of 10 to the fifth ions in the nanopillar. And again, this is just a kind of shot in the dark, but if we said that a thousand ions were to react in a given day, that would give us two years plus of uh, longevity. And so that would create a very useful tool for long-term monitoring of the condition. So as Jake said before, I'm just going to go over some of the electronic components that are going to be required for our sensor to function properly. Uh, they'll all be based in the silicon wafer that we received from the foundry uh, and they will be in encapsulated circuits which will enable our sensor to amplify the signal, reduce noise, convert the signal to a digital signal as well as transmit this to a receiver. Um, and this is just a kind of brief overview of our methodology for doing this. Um, so the neural signals will yield a redox reaction analog input, which we will then pass through a low-pass active filter with an operational amplifier to amplify the signal and reduce noise. And then we'll convert this analog voltage signal into a digital signal to help with the eventual transmission of the signal through a neurotransmitter or nanotransmitter. 
which will be picked up by an external receiver that will have software to analyze the data. So first, we want to amplify the signal that we are receiving from the neural activity. And to do this, we've decided on an inverting operational amplifier to enhance these voltages sensed by our sensor's interface. And this is necessary for better signal resolution and for the ability to us to, down the road, actually transmit a clean signal to a receiver. And as you can see, actually, if you go back now, you're fine. Right here, uh, we can actually manipulate the gain of the operational amplifier using the resistors so that we can maximize the output of the voltage signal while not sacrificing too much power. Uh, and then we plan on using an active low pass filter to terminate any signals higher than a specified cutoff frequency. Uh, this helps reduce noise due to unwanted high frequency neural activity that could have negative effects on our data or in transmitting the data. And to do this, we, it's actually pretty simple. We just add a capacitor in parallel with the resistor that's shown here. Uh, and this basically acts as a short circuit. So due to the impedance of the capacitor, so at higher frequencies, which we can set, high, higher frequencies past the cutoff frequency of which we can set based on the resistance and capacitance of the circuit. Uh, we then plan to convert this to a digital signal uh, using an analog to digital converter. Um, we set our sights on an 8-bit serial converter, which will convert the signal to an 8-bit binary number that will allow us to interface the sensor hardware with the software that will be in the digital or in the receiver. And here is an example of what an 8-bit serial converter looks like. And as you can see, there's the input voltage down there, and it goes to a digital processor, which in then turn outputs a series of binary digits to make an 8-bit binary number, which we can then pass to a transmitter to transmit the data. So we will use a nano FM transmitter in order to do this. And this works by in taking the digital data and embedding it into a generated radio frequency, which is then sent to a receiver. And the receiver, like I said previously, will contain software with algorithms that we will determine in order to analyze and process the data for medical professionals and patients as well. The only issue with the transmitter is that transmitters require a lot of power to function properly, and sometimes they, that can result in overheating, which would not be beneficial at all for a sensor that's been implanted in the brain. So I, we found a possible solution, which is actually in, still in development, but it's a self-powered nanotransmitter that draws its power from mechanical vibrations within the body using a nano generator, and it's been proven already in its infancy that it, they can transmit clean signals of up to 30 feet. So like James said before, the whole purpose of this is to be able to accurately diagnose Alzheimer's so that we can make sure that patients who do have Alzheimer's are able to treat their um, conditions as soon as possible. And there are no FDA approved um, treatments for Alzheimer's that focus on reducing or maintaining amyloid plaque levels in the brain. So we are, we have done research to look at um, some companies or people who are doing research that focuses on um, reducing amyloid plaque levels. And one is um, a treatment called receptor, which reduces amyloid plaque levels um, that are already there. Um, and my subjects that have received this were able to reduce their ha the half-life of the amyloid plaque in their brains by 50% within um, 72 days, you can see this in this figure here. The first um, bar is the control, and the second is with the mice that had the base routine. And the second is um, a treatment called Gleevec from the Fisher Center, which reduced the cleaving of amyloid precursor protein. So this reduced the amount of amyloid plaque that formed in the first place. And you can see again the three. Um, experiments where 
Gleevec was not used compared to the last where the amyloid plaque, I mean the amyloid, yeah, the amyloid plaque levels are much lower. So we would be looking to use our treatments in collaboration with these um, treatments to try and make sure that our patients had the most efficient treatment possible. So, <clears throat> the, the sensor design and technical aspects behind this are very impressive. But unless we have a way to get it inside the brain, it's not going to do anyone much good. So we have identified that a minimal level of invasiveness is highly desirable for our system because it will allow for a minimum turnover of patient recovery. We are planning to work with neurosurgeons and biotech researchers to develop our sensor alongside developing neurosurgery techniques so that we can get them both out at the same time and optimize our process. The first thing we're looking at is a diagnostic cerebral angiography, which is currently designed for use in identifying vascular obstruction in the brain, such as aneurysms. What happens is a tiny sheet is inserted in the femoral artery of the thigh, and the catheter is threaded up to the brain, and then an illuminating agent is injected into the brain, which could be replaced with the injection of our sensor. And the turnover for this is about six to eight hours for recovery after a 30-minute process, which can be same day, get to the hospital, recover, get out back to patient family care which is highly desirable. And another process we've been looking at, deep brain stimulation, or DBS, is already well established and used to treat Parkinson's disease. It's slightly more invasive in that a thin insulated wire is inserted into a hole that's drilled in the skull, and then a connecting wire is passed under the skin of the head, neck, and shoulder, joining the inserted lead to the neurostimulator, which is like a little battery pack that is inserted under the skin of the collarbone, which allows the lead to receive a charge that restores functionality in Parkinson's patients. So we also need a company to be able to produce this sensor, and to get that we need funds. We've been looking at initially receiving a grant from the NIH Brain Initiative, or the NSF, DARPA, or state grants, so that we can get our research off the ground and get proof of concept. The open NIH grants currently we're looking at are novel tools to analyze the cell-specific and circuit-specific processes in the brain and next generation invasive devices for recording and modulation in the human central nervous system. Typically these grants will provide us with one to several hundred thousand dollars, which will allow us to fund our proof of concept experiments and get ourselves going. So in, <clears throat> in the interim between our startup and getting to a finished product that we can sell in the market, we will need intermediary funding. We'll be looking at mostly receiving money from venture capital funds which will give us seed funding so that we can get our product off the ground and actually get it to testing, and then Series A, B, and C venture capital funding, which will involve us relinquishing our equity to these companies in exchange for money that we can use to get our process into animal testing and eventually clinical trials. So <clears throat> these graphs, and this graph, I should say, in this table, show off the availability of venture capital through the recent years. We are looking at basing our company in California, and that is because, as you can see, a large amount of the total amount of venture capital fund available in the United States is in California. New York and Massachusetts are also good options, but we've identified that there are many universities and research labs and firms in California already that will allow us to collaborate and work on our neurosurgery implantation techniques. And this slide will show some of the companies that we plan on working with to get our target funds during the venture capital funding stages in the intermediate process. The first, for example, is Life Science Angels, who has raised over $50 million in 58 startups since their inception. And the New Enterprise Associates have raised over $200 million in 29 startups and since the, that, well, I said, ah, never mind. Keep going. Don't want to go over. So. This is our specific, in detail timeline for how we plan on getting funding and what we're going to do with the money at each stage in the process. Initially, we're going to be looking at the NIH research grants, get about $200,000, and then develop our sensor. We'll probably be located still in the Massachusetts area during this time, working with Northeastern University and other such facilities in the area to get ourselves going. Then we plan on getting seed funding from venture capital firms or angel firms, and we'll use that to validate our design ex vivo and hopefully be able to move on to getting actual venture capital funding, which can range in the millions or tens of millions of dollars, which will fund our mouse experimentation, monkey experimentation, and our PMA and clinical trials, and get our product licensed and available to be provided to the market. So, um, manufacturing the 
sensor will be relatively cheap um, to purchase one mask set it costs about two hundred fifty thousand dollars to produce one wafer at a um, semiconductor fabrication foundry costs about five thousand dollars and the ion implantation process costs about fifty thousand dollars per year and this is all based on a very small scale so once the scale becomes large this all of these numbers will be much smaller and so our chief concerns are animal testing because there are lots of regulations surrounding animal testing and we would also like to be nice to the animals and the pre-market approval process. Um, the monkey exper experimentation stages are very expensive and so is pre-market approval. Um, it can cost anywhere around $10 million. So that's why it's in our series C funding. Um, so Compared to other deep brain simulation technologies, our technology is very cheap because, like I said, it costs about $5,000 to um, make one chip, not chip, sensor. So um, with all the other costs that are that will be included with that as we move along, we have the power to be far below $30,000. And with keeping that in mind, um, 80% of the cost of Alzheimer's disease is from care and everything and a whole bunch of other non-medical um, costs. So um, eliminating the need for that much care is also a big pull for um, patients who would like to try our, or not patients, for you to invest in us. <laughs> <laughs> So our safety concerns are that the sensor has to be biocompatible, um, and we also, like I said, need pre-market approval for a class three medical device. So a class three medical device needs to support or sustain human life, um, be and have substantial importance in preventing impairment of human health or present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Um, so with our animal tests, we'll be able to determine um, what kind of conditions our patients will be, I mean, what kinds of patients will be at high risk. Um, so after animal testing, we'll be able to um, alert early trial human participants of whether or not they should be an early trial human participant based on whether or not they'll be at higher risk. So, in conclusion, the sonic sensor will be a nanoscale electrochemical sensor for the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, and it will um, accurately detect the amount of amyloid plaque in the brain. So, among those reasons, you should also invest in sonic diagnostics because we um, will be the first company to have um, an accurate diagnose, diagnosis for um, Alzheimer's disease. We are working to um, collaborate with other um, companies, groups who um, are focusing on the amyloid plaque levels in the brain. So they are looking to solve the issue and not mitigate it. And we are also, um, and Alzheimer's is also a very large um, cause of death in the United States. And once one of the top 10 um, deadly diseases, and it's not being improved, so we're offering some samples. So um, what we're looking to do in the future is to secure intellectual property, um, have a lab scale proof of concept, learn about the oxidation p potential of the amyloid plaque precursor and protein, um, and estimate our reaction rate in vivo for that um, oxidation Jake was talking about earlier, and to collaborate with neurosurgeons and drug researchers to get some advice from them about the best ways to implant our device and how we could um, make our device the safest for our patients and align the best with their treatments, um, and to push the device to commercialization. And thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Okay. Floor is open to any questions. Let's ask questions. So you have this device you implanted, and say you find someone who's willing to use it, you implant it, uh, and the objective is it detects this protein which leads to Alzheimer's. Did you consider 
any uh, possible other materials than the human body that might give a false signal? Because you wouldn't want to uh, get a false signal from you don't really have Alzheimer's, but maybe there's something else in the body that can affect your sense. Would you consider that? Yeah, that's um, selectivity is a concern for any um, biosensor because uh, obviously there's a ton of different materials moving around. Um, we uh, we won't know. That's another thing you can't really predict until you're actually looking at real data. Um, but you know, our theory, our hope would be that by being so close to uh, the cell membrane itself, and knowing that this is a prevalent protein across the membrane whose specific function is to reduce copper ions. We, um, yeah, I mean, we're concerned about that, but it's the type of thing you can't know whether or not you'll be selective until you're actually in there looking at it. Um, but we think the design is reasonably uh, adequate. Yes. We're not spending a lot of time on those animal trials before we go into humans, and a lot of money as well to ensure patient safety. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, we're done. <laughs>